a few moments. Obviously, we've already done the body composition lab, and now I am wonderfully uh, hitting the record button. Now, my massive oversight, guys, remember, we do not have class on Friday, so do not worry about having to punish yourself with that critical power lab yet. You can get it done early if you'd like. You can turn it in early if you'd like, but it is not going to be due this coming Friday. It'll be due the next Friday. Yeah, no worries. So a great question from uh, Holly is things that we should mention for limits to motor control. Okay. So when you think about motor control, you're thinking about your body's ability to obviously, you know, innervate your muscles, get yourself to drink, move around, do anything you need along those lines. So where are our limits? So effectively think about how we recruit our muscles. So that's Henneman size principle as we go up into higher force uh, capacities, we start putting those bigger and bigger force units. So effectively, can we go easily from having our muscles give us 98% of our max strength to 98.5? Or as we get up higher, do we have to effectively go from one, two, three, four, five, and then when we get over say 60%, are we now talking we have to, instead of taking the 1%, we have to go from 60 to 65 to 70 to 80, to 90 to 100, and we're making those bigger jumps so we're not able to have those gradations, okay? The other component when we think about motor control, think about challenges like balance and coordination. So by the nature of the beast, reaction time and ability to react to stimulus and balance is gonna be limited. You know, we can only react so quickly. We've already covered that in one of your other take-home assignments, but obviously think about this again in our ability to orient ourselves and react to things when it comes to balance. Maybe look at also things like reflex that's going not all the way to the higher brain, but it's just going through the spinal cord. Like you touch a really high, uh, hot plate and your hand naturally pulls away before you actually feel the sensation of your fingers burning. So um, those are some good spots to really start off with when we're talking about uh, motor control. You can even maybe talk about potentially some disease states. Uh, unfortunately, folks that have got things like cerebral palsy and then obviously different levels of being uh, paraplegic and quadriplegic and obviously loss of uh, muscle innervation there. You can even talk about sarcopenia if you wanna talk about how getting old can be brutal. Um, but I think that should give you guys a lot of kind of basic directions of where to look at with this and kind of how to you know, start off when you're thinking about like effectively how well can we control our body? How fast can we coordinate things? And then think about the neurological control synchronization rate coding, specifically when we're trying to produce force. So when people are trying to get better at movements, it takes a little while until our nervous system is gonna be that efficient at it. So um, yes, you can do that at the rec, any place you get a, you can find a uh, bike or uh, something like a Schwein Aerodyne if you really hate yourself. I would also suggest um, if you guys are interested, you can come by the lab and use the uh, Monarch cycle. We have it in here. Just make sure that you schedule it uh, with myself and uh, obviously Ihor, because we've got subjects coming in for studies and um, some body comp testing we're going to be doing, which is fascinating since we're going to be touching on that, obviously, right now today. So now, obviously, when it comes to body composition, we're going to talk about, you know, first and foremost, what are we really looking at? How can we assess it? How does it really affect performance in sport? How weight standards are typically unequivocally stupid and how we want to really try to get to the optimal weight for that individual. And that's you know a very hard thing to get at. Like anything else, remember success leaves clues. So if an athlete tends to perform the best at this body weight, at this body comp uh, composition at their given endeavor, let it ride. We don't need to force somebody into certain aesthetics or otherwise. Now, if you're trying to be one of the problems we have quite frequently with body composition and, you know, sports and life in general is we think about, you know, having six pack abs or whatever type of aesthetics is currently popular. Um, it seems to be gluteal hypertrophy with uh, females as the end all be all, whatever. Um, if that's what you're into, cool, good for you. But does that actually help you in all sporting endeavors? Does that, all, does that make you a healthier person and so on and so forth? Not necessarily. So probably not in a number of cases anyways. We just wanna make sure that that individual is 
healthy and able to perform at the high levels. So, and obviously feels good, that happy part. So they're comfortable with their life and everything else. And for those of you guys that have been to lab, you know about that third H, but I do not want to record that and have that on YouTube. But other folks have talked about it before. You can just uh, Google the three H's with athletes and somebody will talk about it. So we're going to talk about a little bit about nutrition and how we've got our three major macronutrients, our carbs, fats, and our protein, which we're going to get into all this a lot more in bioenergetics. Some of you guys are in it now. A lot of you guys are going to be in it in the future. So we're not going to touch on it too much other than caloric balance is the first end all be all. After that, we prioritize whatever macronutrient is really being utilized energetically and or what we're trying to do with long-term goals. So building muscle, maintaining muscle, et cetera. We want to make sure we stay hydrated and we are replenishing our electrolytes, which are really just minerals. And obviously when we get dehydrated, our performance goes down. Uh, athletes should eat appropriately to their sports and the demands of those sports. And sport drinks are effectively sugar water with a little bit of electrolytes and really good in very specific contexts. But your average person doesn't need them whatsoever. Uh, obviously, we've got a couple folks in here that are pretty hard training and hard charging, so it can definitely be useful, but it's not necessary for everybody. So really all body comp is, is the chemicals and molecules that make you up, okay? So we've got a number of different basic models. So we've got the chemical model, the anatomical model, and then what is known as the two compartment model. There's also the three compartment model and the four compartment model, which I'll touch on briefly. So chemical model is just separating you between how much of you is fat, protein, carbohydrate, water, and then minerals, okay? The anatomical model is based upon tissue types. So we've got fat cells, muscle cells, organs, which that's a huge catch-all, bone, which is actually gonna be way smaller than that from the anatomical uh, model there, and then other. So this is gonna be things in your digestive tract, uh, phlegm, um, extracellular fluid, um, interstitial fluid, and kind of a couple other side things there, your immune cells, what have you. Now, the two compartment model, which is what we're doing whenever you guys would do the bod pod, the Tanita, or the Sozo, and the same thing with the skin fold, where it effectively puts you in two buckets. You have fat mass and then everything else, fat-free mass. Now the three compartment model is going to be fat mass, fat-free mass, and then bone mass. And then the four compartment model is fat mass, water mass, fat-free mass, and bone mass. And so each of them have certain advantages. The big thing to keep in mind, guys, is we just need to stay consistent in whatever method we're tracking people over long periods of time. That's going to let us know what's going on. And we're going to see, obviously, are we making the type of changes that we're looking to do? And for some folks, remember, the goal is not to change. The goal is to stay relatively similar to how you are. So now the basic BMI uh, which is going to be your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared is based on really old, like as in made up by a mathematician in the 1800s that he effectively took the pragmatic solution, which was instead of using his original thoughts on the formula, which would be about um, your height in or your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters to the 2.5 power, because you know when you're doing all this by hand, it was slide rules and an abacus, you don't really want to go to the 2.5 power. So he took the easy way out. And that's why the BMI to this day is really essentially misguided when you're looking at people of average height. So or very short or very tall. So if you're under like 5'2", five, 5'3", five, it allows you to effectively be much heavier relative to your height and not give you a higher BMI. Whereas individuals that are much taller, it's actually going to give them a much higher BMI than what you'd really suspect for their height. So what we really want to do is measure what percentage of that body happens to be fat mass and then compare it to the rest of the fat-free mass. So in general, specifically when we're talking about aerobic sports, when we're talking about some specific versions of strength power sports, a higher percent body fat typically causes a decrease in performance. Now, there are a multitude of exceptions to this rule. So by no means is this always gonna be the solution 
And like we talked about with the spaceship example in lab, like anything else, at a certain point, you're starting to make the body so small that you are massively upticking the risk of injury. And we're now starting to talk about taking down a number of those systems of the body because they're being underfueled. So dense atometry, hydrostatic weighing, the basic idea is literally figuring out how dense your body is. And based upon that density, we can extrapolate effectively how much of you is going to be lean, how much can be fat, because the good old muscle sinks, fat floats. Now, this requires being inside of a dunk tank. It's absolutely miserable. If any of you guys want to try it for fun, you're more than welcome to. I do not require it as a lab because you have to hold your body completely underwater while sitting on a scale inside of the uh, athletic training pool and hold still while you've already pushed all the air out of your lungs. It is not fun. So we don't. Now, dual energy X-ray absorbitometry, that's the DEXA. That's what we do have. We're able to look at not just your fat mass, your lean mass. We can also get your bone mass, and we can also break it down region by region throughout the body, which is great information. The problem with the DEXA is it's pretty expensive. The DEXA scanner we have in there literally cost over a hundred grand, and that happens to be the base model. The high, like super high tier, you can scan offensive alignment on it, like massive uh, scanning area. That one typically, if I remember correctly, is closer to like 200 grand. Now, air displacement plethysmography, that happens to be the bod pod. And that's just another way of trying to extrapolate densitometry, only instead of having to try to drown yourself, you can go ahead and sit inside of that little egg-shaped room, which is in the other backside of the lab, if you guys want to take a look. And from there, it tries to and estimates effectively how much space your body occupies inside of it by moving a diaphragm and changing the air pressure inside. And we know how much you weigh, so obviously mass of the body divided by, uh, or sorry, yeah, mass of the body divided, divided by the volume of the body, and we've got the basic density of the body. Now, skin folds, where we're going to go ahead and pinch an inch all throughout the body, gives us some good information on effectively subcutaneous fat, but it's making a lot of assumptions. It was based originally on cadavers, and, you know, different people store fat in different organizations, and obviously, like we learned in lab, there's a huge variation on how good people are measuring it. And then finally, we have bioelectrical impedance. That is going to be where a very light current is going through the body and happens to be going through either one hand to the other, which is a problem because it doesn't go through the lower body whatsoever, or it goes from one leg to the other, which is a problem because it never goes to the upper body, or it's the multi-point one like the sozo. So it's going from one hand to one leg, one leg to the other hand, both hands to each other, both feet to each other. And that's going to give us much better information, but it still is prone to errors like all of these uh, different methods. None of them are perfect. The DEX is probably going to be your closest followed by the hydrostatic uh, weighing or the bioelectrical impedance spectroscopy, which uses a number of different uh, frequencies that it samples at, as opposed to absorbitometry that just uses one. And then your skin folds, if you're really good, you might be better than BIS or BIA systems, but for most part, points are gonna be a lot worse, but the key is consistency. So we use the same method every single time we scan individuals. So, We've now talked about the wonders of uh, effectively what's going on with hydrostatic weighing. And this is an example of said dunk tank that you have to hold yourself completely underwater. And in fact, this is a bad test because you can see her upper back is actually sitting above the water. So shame on you. Dexa laying down on your back where now we can see everything, but it's great because we can actually compare the lean mass on your right arm to your left arm from your right leg to your left leg and see where you're also making progress in those areas. Now, skin folds, where we're gonna take those samples from different areas where we have to be very accurate. This is a wired BIA uh, a system uh, where you're gonna lay down, they put electrodes on your uh, wrist and hand and your ankle and your foot. And from there, it's gonna be able to obviously give ideas of body composition. And they're going to be within a really good system will be within 3% of which a real body fat percent really is. But once again, guys, the key is remaining consistent over long periods of time. So in general, the more muscle mass you have, the more awesome you are. Okay. But like anything else, it's really important to give us, because muscle is where we're producing all the force in our body. We have a greater amount of muscle. We're typically more powerful, stronger athletes, and potentially have better muscular endurance. Now, obviously, once you get to a certain level, you become less efficient because you just simply have more muscle mass for things like endurance endeavors. And that's why a 100 meter sprinter 
and a marathoner always have very, very different amounts of muscle mass. Now, body fat itself is effectively going to be dead weight. It's something we've got to carry with us. It does happen to be obviously pretty energy dense storage that we can use. And in general, it tends to be obviously not something we want to have too much of, but it's going to serve as also padding on our joints and throughout our body. So getting to be too lean in certain sports is going to massively increase our risk of injury. And it's funny, actually with swimmers, it decreases your buoyancy to a certain extent if you have too little body fat, which makes swimming far, far more difficult. Now, one of the hands down dumbest things you can ever do is going to be weight standards. So this is going to be the idea of just because you're this height or you're in this sport, you need to weigh this amount. Um, think about, gosh, guys, it wasn't even, maybe it was, uh, probably was about 10 years ago these days when a lot of people talked about how there's, you, Usain Bolt shouldn't be that great of a sprinter. He's too tall. Well, obviously he didn't pay attention to that. So you're going to have, when you're looking at elite level athletes in any given sport, you're going to see a lot of similarities, but even within those similarities, there's still going to be inter individual differences. So like anything else, we want to focus on trying to make that athlete as optimal for their sport as they can be. And everyone, irregardless of whether or not they're playing basketball, soccer, football, et cetera, are all playing in a uh, contact and sometimes combat sport called life. And because of this, we need to have a certain amount of body fat. Now, do you need to be ultra lean so you can, in a pinch, be able to do your laundry on your abs? Not necessarily, but like anything else, too much body fat, that's just more dead weight, making things a little bit more difficult, which in some cases obviously increases your risks of different uh, health issues, but it's not always going to cause those issues. And the antithesis is if you're too lean, now we don't have much of a reserve. If we get sick, we don't have much to fall back upon. And now we're going to be more likely to have some major negative health outcomes. So when we're working with any athlete in general, the key is look at how are they performing? We write the program, we run the program, we see how their body changes, and we see how that then influences their performance. If they perform better at their sport in a fluffier state, higher body fat, more power to them. Keep running the program. If they perform better, slightly leaner, same thing. Keep going, but check in and make sure there's not that point where we're going to be too fluffy or too lean. And then if they perform great and their body comp stays the same and they're performing better, keep it the same. We don't have to fit within certain very fixed mindset ideas of what a human is supposed to look like. If you're trying to be an athlete, your goal is to be an athlete. Racehorses don't look at other racehorses and go, oh shit, did you see the striations on the glutes of that, of that racehorse? Oh man, I wish I looked as good as them. They have no concept of that. All they know is I need to go fast and faster than the person next to me. And it's not, they're not doing the pose down competition before they go out and do the run. They're just going out there and running it. And that's what we're trying to get our athletes to do, which is hard because we have a lot of societal pressures coming from the other side. So when in doubt, if someone brings up weight standards, think about your position, your role, and what you're doing right there. If you guys are in a position where you're an intern, you're an observer, just put in your back pocket, this person is dumb and should not be trusted. If you're in a position of power, attack it, do not allow it to stand because it is very wrong. Our goal, once again, is to make the athlete into the best athlete they can be. And maybe even thinking about the idea that at some point they're going to stop being that athlete. And we want to make sure that they're going to have a good relationship with food, a good relationship with their body and being able to, oh, I don't know, live the rest of their life without doing a lot of unfortunately negative uh, health behaviors when it comes to uh, diet and exercise. So there's nothing wrong about having goals and saying that, yeah, I am 300 pounds and I'm five feet tall. Oh, uh, Colleen, that is a male cross-country team. If you found two females below 10%, you are now talking about, we have got, we're hard into amenorrhea. We're definitely getting into that female athlete triad of lower bone mineral density and quite possibly going to be getting osteopenic um, and then maybe even disordered eating. You're rarely going to find 
uh, individuals that are that low in body fat. And, you know, really high level male cross country athletes, you might find that, but even then notice this is based on one specific data set. This isn't everybody's data, because trust me, I've ran the data on your team and the men's team and everything else. And though you guys are all good athletes, no one is ready to go step on a bodybuilding uh, stage. And that's okay. That's not the goal here. I mean, is there a pose down before every cross country meet? Do you guys like just kind of walk up and just like put a flex on the other team to let them know that, you know, you're bringing the heat and they're not? Is there any like kind of dominance like that? I think you'd probably do better, Colleen, if there was more kind of like a scrum or a little bit of a melee. So, you know, you could kind of, let's just say, maybe aim for the knees of some of the girls on the other side, but we'll leave that alone. Now, unfortunately, weight class sports are obviously a thing. Now, a number of sports, much larger athletes do have a gigantic advantage over lower weight class athletes. So it makes perfect sense. The key is, however, is the behaviors we're going to use in order to get into those weight classes. Now, I have competed in a number of different weight classes in uh, powerlifting and strongman. The lightest weight class I ever uh, competed in was 181. And I was down, I, I actually weighed in for one of the last nationals I did at 181 at like 179.8. And, and I started my diet to get down there at effectively about 207. Um, in about two months, I cut the weight to go down there. Uh, yeah, that is bodybuilders. They definitely do a pose down and they really do, yeah, you know, literally flex on one another. But um, the things that I've done to make a uh, weight class between essentially glycogen depletion, sweating in saunas, hot tubs, hot pools, uh, heaters and cars, um, I wouldn't suggest that for anyone to really do that. If you guys want to have a conversation in person about practices there, um, we can talk about it, but you got to have a really good reason for doing it. And, and I do not say this lightly. Literally the last time I, um, I competed at 181, my uh, obviously uh, then girlfriend, now wife, told me that if you ever do that again, I'm leaving you. So needless to say, I have not gone down into the 180 pounds. Uh, I haven't, I've only touched 190 pounds once in the past two years, and that was because of the stomach flu. So like anything else, it's very hard on the body. And when we're talking about dehydration, once you're getting over 10% of your body weight lost through uh, essentially sweating, now you're risking death. And uh, yeah, you can actually feel your heart working harder at rest. It feels like everything when you're moving your body around is about to pull. Just everything feels uh, really tight and it feels like it's kind of grinding, like it's not really moving. Um, yeah, don't do that. So Hey, there you go. There's all the things that I've done that you shouldn't do. Um, a lot of pro athletes in MMA, boxing, etc., they will use things like um, diuretics, so like Lasix and other drugs that'll help them lose a lot of water weight. Then they'll use IV fluid to put it back on. Um, I never did that. Uh, it obviously can be very hard on the body. If you do things wrong, you can easily take yourself out. Um, and like anything else, if we are not actually fueling ourselves like we're supposed to, this is where we're gonna talk about, yeah, we're gonna be losing weight, we're gonna be tired. And not only is our performance gonna go down, but our injury risk is gonna go up. And this is gonna be typically due to, we're just not getting enough carbs, fats, and proteins to fuel the demands that we have. Now, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff can get itself into disordered eating, which then can lead itself into things like anorexia nervosa, which is, has, has the highest, highest, lethality rate of every single mental illness. That is another thing that should be alarm bells. Anorexia nervosa literally is far more lethal than any other essentially mental health or mental illness, which is not nothing to sneeze at. Uh, bulimia nervosa, this is going to be individuals that are doing kind of that binging and purging uh, type thing, or they'll use laxatives to get things out. And otherwise, I mean, it's it's rough on the body. If you're throwing up that much, you're having a lot of damage to your teeth, uh, your esophagus, and otherwise that can show itself up in a lot of other negative issues. You know, anorexia nervosa, you're talking about under fueling, which is going to cause obviously underperformance and then increase your risk of injury. Some of those individuals are going to die of heart failure, even though they're obviously very skinny. Um, 
yeah, I'm sure if you've never been around somebody that uh, unfortunately walked down this road, it is a hard thing to see a human to go through. And anorexia, they'll usually hide and bag your clothing and other types of ways so that you can't really tell that they're losing all that weight until things get to be pretty rough. Uh, bulimia nervosa, this individuals can be of absolutely normal weight and then they are doing this type of binging and purging uh, type behaviors because you know this is how they're effectively you know trying to manage unrealistic weight standards and otherwise, which it can be really, really hard. Um, when it comes to a lack of caloric intake and menstrual dysfunction, delayed menarche, so we're talking about puberty starts later than it should, oligomenorrhea, meaning their period only comes like once every two or three months, and that's not because of that's been their normal cycle since they've been an adult, and then amenorrhea, where it's just not happening whatsoever. This is obviously something that happens a lot more in low body weight sports, and it's typically due to a really big mismatch between the caloric intake and the caloric expenditure. Now, that does not mean that they're starving themselves. It could mean that they're training so hard with so much volume, they're not eating enough effectively to equate that out. And there's some good research using actually really high level competitive swimmers that they thought they were hitting a hard training block and then a taper for their competition. So that way they perform really well that week. And they all sucked because they did way too much work that week and they were under fuel. But the funny thing is, is if I believe it was either two weeks or a month later, they had them just compete their event where they hadn't really trained and they all PR. So they did the training, but the training was too severe compared to the fueling, compared to the recovery capabilities of those athletes that it had that delayed effect. So when they needed to be good, they weren't good. So it is really important, specifically when you're working with female athletes, if you've got that level of maturity and you can have that conversation with them of effectively, you know, are you having a consistent cycle? Um, how is your cycle? How are you managing it? And just, you know, it doesn't have to be anything too, um, uh, what should we say, you know, world of overshare, but it gives us some information as to what's going on, how well their athletes are recovering and how they're feeling. Now, what one of the, what's one of the major issues if we're going to try to effectively with our athletes, uh, female, obviously, tracking their cycle, that's going to be a major kind of monkey wrench in the, um, in the works. What's going to be a potential thing that's going to make it a lot harder to really be able to infer what's going on? No worries, Courtney. So if we're working with female athletes, okay, and we're trying to obviously get this information uh, from them on effectively what's their menstrual cycle like, and then we're oligorrhea where like the rhythm's kind of getting weird or then amenorrhea, it's disappearing. What's a major confounding factor when you're dealing with specifically, um, you know, college age women or high school or really women in general Privacy is always going to be a thing. Absolutely, Noah. Yeah, it can be unpredictable. And that's where every woman has their own cycle, which that's a major confounding factor. Some women are on a four-week cycle. Some women are on a five or a six-week. I've heard nightmare ones where there's women that are on a two-week cycle. And so you've got to have that information and kind of set what each person's baseline is. And if you've never met them when they had a normal cycle, you don't have that information. But what's the major, what's another major uh, modifier? <laughs> Honesty, great job, Abby. That is a real big thing because, uh, well, um, I am recording this, obviously, so we will not throw anyone under the bus, but I will simply say, allegedly, do you feel like you have some teammates that you've maybe perhaps participated in sports, sports with recently that have maybe lied to their athletic trainer about what's going on with their cycle and otherwise, and their health in general. Yes, absolutely. Now, outside of potential lies, outside of 
inter-female variability, what's something that a female can take that's going to obviously change what her normal cycle uh, routine would be like? Yes. So if you're working with a female and she's on some form of birth control that causes her to have a period only, gosh, um, I know talking with some um, friends of mine um, that like they only have a cycle like once every three months and one of them, thanks to the form of birth control they're using, they haven't had a period in like over a year. Um, and they are pretty cool with it. However, how are you supposed to manage and <laughs> follow a cycle if you have no idea what that cycle is? And it's obviously also being hormonally manipulated so you don't have the natural effects that you'd otherwise see. Does that make sense to you guys? <laughs> now, obviously, remember back to our spaceship example, and specifically, remember calcium is really important for muscular contraction. The body's gonna prioritize muscle contraction over bone mineral density 100% of the time. So if we keep robbing Peter, the bones, to pay Paul, the muscles, that's where we're gonna have a much higher rate of stress fractures, uh, stress reactions, and then obviously just straight out fractures. And so the female athlete triad, we have disordered eating, uh, amenorrhea, menstrual disorders, and low bone mineral density. This is something that obviously can happen a lot in sports that effectively require, you know, large volumes of work, a certain amount of emphasis on different aesthetics. And that's not necessarily just your cross country kids, but then you can find this in not just gymnastics, dance, you can talk about cheerleading, and it can even show up in sports you wouldn't think of. You can have basketball players, you can have volleyball players, you can have softball players. And because of gender equality, we also have guys that are uh, unfortunately falling prey to anorexia nervosa, and it shows up more likely in sports like wrestling, where you do have that weight class and otherwise, um, at least definitely with some disordered eating at different points. So it's really hard to try to overcome the tidal wave of bullshit of social media, cultural and other expectations of what a perfect body is. Uh, Cause remember guys, any body on a beach is technically a beach body. And so doing what you can in your own little way to, you know, not diminish a person's sense of self to not try and put weird emotional relationships with food, with their interpretations of their body. Most folks, unfortunately, are going to get part of this from their parents, obviously part of this from their friend group, from their culture, uh, from the areas they're around. But understanding that if we're trying to play sports, we're just trying to be, you know, good citizens of planet Earth. Let's be nice to each other and try not to drive people into horrible situations. Now, think about individuality, think about genetics. Certain sports, if you really want to be good, and you know, so I was a cheerleader, as a male cheerleader, as a base, the bigger you are, typically the better of a base you are. As a female flyer, the antithesis. And if you happen to be a naturally, you know, four foot 11 female, it's easy to be weight wise small and by that extension, a better flyer. Whereas for a female, if you want to be a flyer and you're five, six, five, seven, you know, you're just above average for height for women. That if you've got a naturally a broader bone structure, naturally a body that wants to be a bigger, that's very, very hard to hold that for long periods of time. Uh, yes, uh, any of these type of athletes. In fact, one of the issues with uh, male athletes is going to be getting into bigorexia, which is the idea with bodybuilders that they're never big enough. So they have to keep gaining weight and gaining weight and gaining weight. And it's, it sounds odd. And I, I'm not saying this as a, like, everyone come and look and see how cool I am. But, and I told you guys about this in, uh, for those of you guys that were at lab where, you know, the training group that I would work with, I would be referred to as little Mike because big Mike was 390. So yeah, I walk around usually these days by around, around 210, give or take, depending on how much moving and how much eating I've done the day before. And I will, I'm not saying this to, you know, 
I don't know, try to gain attention or anything along those lines. But in all seriousness, I do not think of myself as big whatsoever. I think of myself as probably not big enough for the things that I like to do when it comes to picking up heavy objects and setting them back down. And so, whereas a number of other folks, depending on perspective, who they are, where they've been, and otherwise might look at somebody like me and be like, that's a pretty big guy. And like, you have you seen the, like the football lineman we have downstairs? Like, I look like a little kid next to most of those guys. Well, a little kid with a receding hairline and a commanding mustache presence compared to any of them. But uh, yes, you can find a lot of these type of disordered eatings. And guys, is it that hard to think of examples of friends, family members that have done crash diets, that have done uh, certain things in order to manipulate their body weight rapidly so they can look in different ways? It's not going to be ever anything that is something that's that easy to solve, you know, in two seconds. So yes, if we're looking at weight standards, it's ranges. Think about a range of weight. Think about a range of more body fat percentage that we're looking for an athlete to be. So we're really trying to think about, okay, for this athlete in this given sport, we want to see a body composition in these ranges. Now notice for women with bodybuilding, when you get on stage, you are unhealthy. That is no question around it. You are way too lean. And the same thing is going to be true with males. Whereas if we're tar- uh, starting to look more at long distance athletes, we're looking at you know, folks that are going to be out there doing distance work, you know, we can see much higher body fat percentage than people that are still very healthy. And notice guys, this is older data. And if anything, I wouldn't even trust these percentages they're given. I would say a number of these are gonna be based on skin folds, which are naturally gonna give people a lower body fat percentage than what they really are going to have. So like anything else, we want to remember inter-individual differences. We want to make sure that our athletes are effectively, we're not trying to make everyone weigh the exact same weight. So uh, for example, if you don't mind, so obviously, uh, I'm sorry I pick on you guys a lot because it's easy, but you know, Abby and Colleen on the cross country team, what would you guys, how short is the shortest girl on your team and how tall is the tallest uh, long distance runner on your team? Give them one moment to respond. So from anywhere from what looks like, we'll just round it and say 5'10", and the shortest being 5'2". I think you have a teammate that's only like five feet tall. But either way, if the coaches tomorrow said every girl on the team needs to weigh 120 pounds, that 5'10 lady is going to be incredibly underweight and unhealthy. Meanwhile, that five foot tall girl is going to be, that she'll be a, definitely a healthy BMI if anything, she might be a little bit, not necessarily like overweight in the, oh God, we're unhealthy sense, but more or less overweight and probably not going to be as good at the long distance running potentially if they are five feet tall and 120 pounds. So hence, let's think about percentage of body fat. Because no matter how tall or short you, you are, that's still the basic percentage you have. So one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about diet is a lot of people forget and they think of a diet as an endpoint. Like I will finish the diet, I will weigh this much and then it is over. Instead, in the words of the venerable Ice Cube, life's not a track meet, it's a marathon. So we need to think about what is the sustainable practice that we're gonna be able to maintain for the longest period of time. Cause that's what's really rough for people that, you know, they get up to 300 pounds and now they wanna get down to a healthy body weight. The methods you use to lose all that weight are eerily similar to the method you're gonna to have to use to keep that weight off. And so if you're not comfortable with maintaining this for incredibly long periods of time, you shouldn't do it. And so our real goals are going to be cutting back our calories a little bit, definitely making sure that we're exercising, increasing our muscle mass and decreasing our fat mass, and only trying to do this at about a rate of what really equates to a pound or two a week. And if I were you guys, think of it relative to the individual's body size, uh, we really wanna keep it around 1% or less. So if you're a 400 pound person, losing four pounds a week is no issue. 
But if you're a hundred pound person, you try to pull off four pounds a week, literally 4% of body mass, we're asking for issues. Like anything else, we're going to have the slowing. That's going to be changes because now we have a lighter body. So our basal metabolic rate is going to be lower. We're not going to be fidgeting as much. We're not going to be eating as much. So our thermal effect of food is down. Don't worry about it. That's beyond the scope of this class, but we talk about it in bioenergetics. So now let's talk about fueling. If you happen to be playing sports that have major caloric demands, specifically in that glycolytic, aerobic, and anaerobic systems, we're talking about nearly two thirds of your calories should probably be coming from carbohydrates. Now, fat is not something to be demonized, but we do need it because it's important for hormone production, uh, for membranes in all of our cells, and a couple other uh, components that they're effectively signaling molecules and otherwise it makes them very useful. And protein, obviously for building muscle mass and otherwise. So we want to make sure that we're getting in enough of each of these. Now, there are huge variations on this scheme. No diet is perfect. The key is what is, once again, that sustainable diet that is going to work for the individual you are working with, that they're going to adhere to, and that hopefully allows them to not just perform well, but also feel good while they're doing it, okay? Anybody can be on any diet that effectively, if it works for them, that's great. Problem is when people find a diet that works for them, may it be keto, carnivore, vegan, et cetera, they tend to become very evangelical about it. Like they got to tell everybody about how this is the solution. This is the way. Instead, it's fine for you to find your way. And that's awesome. Do it. And when you find what works for you, keep it up. However, understand the thing that works for you, the diet that you enjoy can be very different than the diet that other people are going to enjoy. We're all different. There's nothing wrong with that. Instead, let's think about what are they going to be able to sustain that's going to get them to do what they want to do. Oh, come on. By skipping breakfast, I'm so much healthier. Hey, um, bad joke, but intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is not necessarily bad for you. It's all about how you set it up and organize it. Some people like it. Um, I've seen case studies of where people have tried it and it really jacked them up hormonally. Uh, specifically, it's actually more women that seem to do much worse on intermittent fasting. It seems mostly uh, young bros tend to do better on uh, intermittent fasting than most other populations. The key is, once again, find what works for you and understand that's what works for you. And I'm not trying to go down this road whatsoever, guys, but doesn't that sound eerily similar to talking about religion? But we need to keep in mind, as long as people are mashing their demands, they're healthy, they're happy, that other age is happening for them, however much they want, go for it. Who cares? You know, that's their diet. You do your thing. But don't tell me that I need to be vegan. Don't tell me that I need to be carnivore. Don't tell me that I need to be on intermittent fasting. Instead, I know what works for me. And I'm more than happy to help tell you what worked for me and to give you other ideas of what, what might work for you. There's nothing wrong with that. So, we have got some basic kind of low bars that we want to make sure we clear when it comes to getting in enough of different vitamins, minerals, macronutrients. And what we're, the RDA was the older version. Now we're talking about is going to be more of the DRI. And this is where we're going to have it up high enough that we're going to typically not have issues with not getting enough in. So uh, estimated average yeah, requirements, recommended daily allowance, upper limit and adequate intake. So like anything else, we want to be within those certain levels. We got carbs, we got fats, we got proteins, vitamins. So A, B, C, D, E, K, and a lot of B vitamins within there. Um, then we've got all the different minerals. So that's where electrolytes is and water. Yay, all of our major nutrients, even though we don't get any energy from water, we consider it technically a macronutrient because we have to take in a lot of it every single day. So. Carbs come in a number of different varieties from simple, meaning the mono and disaccharides to the complex or polysaccharides. We're going to break them down typically and it really comes down to three different basic sugars. Uh, and then also ribose, which is a five carbon sugar. Um, these are six carbon. That's the reason why they're gonna be the normal monosaccharides. And this is going to be the major energy source for your nervous system. You can use ketones, but the body does prefer carbohydrates. And remember, lactate is another three carbon sugar that we can use. So that's going to be important for adding to or taking away from our fat stores along with our protein metabolism. So too much protein is stored as glycogen and fat. Big thing to keep in mind there. And like anything else, how much carbohydrate we're taking in is going to be affecting how much we're replenishing our glycogen stores. So 
really hard glycolytic work. So notice guys, this is training for two freaking hours of aerobic work in a low or a high carb diet. High carb diet, they're doing a great job of replenishing the glycogen, low carb. They were doing a bad job of replenishing the glycogen because they weren't taking as much. Surprise. And depending on how much work you're doing, you can see situations where people are taking 13 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body mass. So if we go back to that cross country girl, we're gonna say she's a buck 10, just because making the math easy and I'm being lazy. If she's weighs, so that's 55 kilograms of body mass that she has per day. There are situations where she's gonna be taking in literally it would be about 715 grams of carbohydrate uh, per day in order to keep up that work output. So literally over a pound and a half of straight white sugar, if you wanted to do it that way. Wouldn't suggest it, but it is a mechanism. I've talked a whole lot. I haven't allowed you guys to really put much back there. Do you have any questions before we call it a day here? And remember, no lab on Friday. If you email me about labbing on Friday, I'm going to joke with you and say, yes, you need to be there. And we're going to be meeting at the top of the um, Commonwealth building and do not take the elevator. Make sure you climb all 22 floors. So questions, comments, concerns? That's boring enough for everybody. I will likely not be in town on Friday. Um, if there's a time that you'd like to come in earlier in the week, um, I know you've got your schedule that you got to do around work and everything else. We will try to make that work for you. Okay. Well, if anything changes and opens up, don't hesitate to shoot me an email, Courtney, and we'll figure out a solution there. Um, otherwise, guys, anytime, anytime. We're all getting through this uh, wonderful pandemic together. Uh, stay safe out there, guys. Uh, obviously, I won't be seeing you guys in, in person as much this week, but take care of yourselves. I'll see you guys back here, obviously, on Wednesday, where we're going to keep going through this. We've only got uh, two more chapters effectively after this one, and then it's just going to be reviewing for the rest of the semester. And if you guys don't want to review, that's fine. We can just uh, have you guys take the final in April, and then you can worry about your other classes. I don't think you guys want to do that, though. Stay safe, okay? See you guys later. Bye-bye.